Good morning. It is June 25th, 2017, and I am so glad that you have tuned in to uh, the broadcast today. And we're going to be talking about the Eastern Gate in Jerusalem, the old city of Jerusalem. And you notice behind me that the uh, Eastern Gate has been sealed off. In other words, you can go to different parts of Jerusalem, and it has many gates that are around it. And all these gates are open. You can go in and out of the city at will. Now, there are times during events... Uh, maybe, you know, certain times of the day they will close these gates with big doors that are massive that they'll shut the gates with. However, this gate is sealed completely. It's not to be used in any way. Now, this is the gate that faces the Mount of Olives and also the Temple Mount side of the old city of Jerusalem. Today, we're going to be talking about this and what this gate represents and who, indeed, it does represent. We're going to Ezekiel chapter 44, verses 1 to 3. So if you have your Bibles, and I certainly hope you do, turn to Ezekiel chapter 44, and we're going to read verses 1 to 3, and then we'll go into the message today. Now also, we're going to be going to Revelation and also the book of John, in case you want to have your finger in place for those two books as well. But Ezekiel chapter 44, verses 1 to 3 reads as this, Then he brought me back the way of the gate of the outward sanctuary, which looketh towards the east, and it was shut. Now again, we see here that Ezekiel is talking about looking outward towards the Mount of Olives, which is east, or if you will, outside of the Temple Mount area, looking east. So he's describing this very gate that stands behind us here. Now, then said the Lord unto me, This gate shall be shut, it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered by it. Therefore it shall be shut. It is for the prince, the prince. He shall sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter in by the way of the porch of the gate and shall go out by the way of the same. Now, it says here that it is the prince. And of course we know that we're talking about a prince of peace, someone who will bring peace into the world. Now, we know already that there are, there is, I should say, one person who is described as the prince or the prince of peace. And of course, that one being Jesus Christ. Now, giving a little history on the gate behind me, June 7, 1967, a Jewish commando, this was during the Six Day War between Jerusalem, uh, Egypt, Syria, and also... Um, parts of Ethiopia and also Jordanian or Jordan if you will. This was a war going on and it was June 7, 1967. The Israelites wanted to enter into the whole old city, the holy city if you will. They wanted to enter in and they could not find a uh, place or, or a position where they could easily enter into. Now they eventually entered in on the Mount Zion side of Jerusalem. But while they were trying to enter in, they were trying to come up with a plan. This gate then in 1967 had been sealed for many hundred years and no one, but no one was to enter that gate. In fact, there was a Muslim uh, graveyard built right in front of this gate that would stop any kind of Jewish Messiah or Jewish people from entering in because they felt as though they would not want to enter in from a graveyard of the Muslim uh, faith. So, they said, why don't we surprise, this is the Jewish commando, he said to his leader, why don't we surprise the Jordanians, blast this gate open, and enter in on the temple side of the city. They would not expect this. They don't think that this would ever happen. Now, as this commando had suggested this, his commander told him, stop. Maybe you don't understand something. And the commando looked at his leader and said, what is it I don't understand? He said, that gate is for our Messiah to enter in. And no one else shall enter into that gate. That gate will stay shut. It will stay sealed until the day our Messiah enters in into that gate. And to this very day, in fact, we were there just about a year ago. And that gate is still absolutely sealed shut with this Muslim graveyard that's right dead in front of it. They say that only one shall enter to that gate. And the Bible tells us the way this will happen is Jesus Christ will step on the Mount of Olives. When he steps on the Mount of Olives, a great earthquake will happen. When that earthquake happens, the mountain will split from north to south, and then a great valley will form, and that will cause this gate to crumble open. Otherwise, the shutness will crumble down, and it will become open. He will walk in through that gate into the Temple Mount, 
take his rightful place as Messiah, King of Kings and Lord of Lords of all nations. He will then continue on to Mount Zion and set up his millennium kingdom, if you will, from that point. So, that is what the commander was telling the commando. Look, you cannot blast that gate open. In fact, I think he told him, said, even if you try, I think God would stop you simply because that gate is for our Messiah. Now, a lot of people wonder why and how it came about that this gate was sealed shut. Who would say, let's seal this gate until the day the Messiah would come in? Now, a lot of people would suspect, perhaps, that maybe the Jews sealed that off to make a point of their religion. In other words, suddenly the gate sealed off, and it's now uh, sealed off just like Ezekiel had told us it would do. But that's not the case. Who, in fact, sealed this gate was the Muslims. The Muslims had occupied the old city for a long period of time. And as I stated a moment ago, they sealed that gate off because of what Ezekiel chapter 44 verses 1 to 3 stated. It states that a Messiah, the Prince of Peace, if you will, one day will come through this gate. They said there will never be a Jewish Messiah to come back into the old city and take over the old city. Therefore, we, the Muslims, will seal this gate shut. The reason this gate is sealed is because the Muslims who occupied old city of Jerusalem during a certain time sealed this gate. Then they put this Muslim graveyard in front of it saying that no reputable Jewish Messiah will walk through a Muslim graveyard to enter into a sealed shut gate. So we see here that it wasn't the Jews, it wasn't the Christians, it was but the Muslims who sealed this gate shut. Almost a supernatural act as though God were acting in behalf of using those who do not even believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Now the Muslim faith does believe that Jesus existed. They do believe that He was the Son of a Virgin. But they do not believe that He was the Son of God. They believe that is polytheistic. They believe there is, that we believe there are many religions. We believe in one God. One God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three parts to that God who represents each part of our salvation to bring us to that God. We'll get into that in just a moment. But I wanted to make you aware of why this gate is sealed shut, and it was by the Muslims based on what the Bible said. The Jews, they will not open this gate based on what the Bible says. So no matter what faith you're coming from, for some reason, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam all respect the fact that that gate is to stay sealed. It's not to be opened. For one reason or the other, they all believe this is supposed to be sealed shut. Now, that in itself shows an act of God. God is infiltrating into the hearts of each one of those religions, making sure that gate stays shut. Because God had prophesied that gate will be shut. No matter the reason, whatever this particular religion has, that gate will stay shut. It will not be open. So, that is a supernatural act, and we have to admit that somehow. And it is exactly what Ezekiel chapter 44, verses 1 to 3 tells us would be. Now, these beliefs come because mainly the Bible tells us the Messiah, the Messiah alone, will one day be elected as the one to enter into this gate. Now, again, let's read verse 3 just so we can remember what we did read a moment ago. It says, and it is for the prince, the prince, he shall sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by the way of the porch of the gate and go out by the way of the same. Now when he's talking about the porch of the gate, he's talking about the temple mount porch that will basically look out towards the east, if you will. So basically what he's saying is it will stay shut because of one thing, and that is so that the prince shall enter into that gate. That is Bible prophecy. God said it. God will sustain it. And no one shall enter to that gate until the Messiah comes to this earth again. He's already been here, which is Jesus Christ. A second time he shall enter into that gate as King of kings and Lord of lords, is what the Bible tells us. Now, verse 2, Ezekiel states, the gate would be shut. Now let's read that again. Verse 2, talking about the gate will be shut. It says, Then who said the Lord unto me, 
This gate shall be shut. It will not be opened. And no man shall enter in by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it. Therefore it shall be shut. Now, if God said shut the gate, He can use who He wants to. He can use Rip Van Winkle. He can use Abraham Lincoln. He can use King Abdul. He can use Benjamin Netanyahu. He can use Marty Campo. He can use anybody he wants. But if he says that gate will be shut, he will impress upon the heart of that person to shut it. So the fact that the Muslims have shut and sealed that gate simply shows that it was prophesied before they done it and God simply used them to do it. Now, does that mean that they are correct in their beliefs? No, I do not believe they are. I do not believe that they worship Jesus Christ as the only God. In other words, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all are one God. So they're not exactly where they need to be, nor are the Jews. They rejected the Messiah, which is Jesus Christ. They would not accept Him. God incarnate, God becoming as a man. Now, God the Supreme was absolutely still in heaven, but He could breathe the breath of life into man and create a man. So why couldn't He breathe the life of breath into a body and become a man Himself if He wanted to become one? To represent man, to die on a cross and take man's sin away through the same measure that sin came into the world, and that, of course, was through Adam, a man. So God done this. Now, the Jews do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. The Muslims do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. The born-again Christians, absolutely, we believe that He is. But, no matter the case, no matter the case, God used who He had to use to shut and seal this gate because God prophesied that this gate would be sealed shut. And hundreds of years later, after Ezekiel had prophesied this, indeed, this gate was sealed shut, just as God said it would be done. Now, I said this is a long introduction. An introduction to what I really want to get into as far as the meat of this message today. So I ask that you start paying attention closely from this point forward. Now, my purpose of teaching this is found basically in what we have already read in the first part of verse 3. Again, let's read the first part of verse 3, Ezekiel chapter 44. It says, It is for the prince. The prince. He shall sit in it. In other words, the prince alone is the one who will enter into this gate. And the only time that the prince is mentioned in the Bible, any time, it is talking about prince of peace. Any other time you find prince as in a, a godhead, if you will, a part of God, it is describing a prince of peace. Not a prince of war, but a prince of peace. Now, we see that it's talking about this in verse 3. It is giving a prediction, if you will, that the prince, the one that is described as the prince of peace in the Bible, will be the one to set at this gate. In other words, to enter in and to own this gate. He will possess it. It will be his gate. It will be by his power that this gate will open. He will own this gate, so to speak. So, then we go through the Bible. As I challenged a while ago, it says basically who the Prince of Peace is. But for those who do not know, I want to kind of break it down for you just a little bit today. If I say the Prince, and I'm talking about the Prince of Peace, and you don't know this, let me ask you a question from a, another religion perspective. Who, who would you say that the Prince of peace is. In Islam, who is the Prince of Peace? In Judaism, who is the Prince of Peace? Who is the Prince? In other words, the only begotten Son of the King. Who is that Prince? And where in your theologies does it describe and talk about a Prince? Now, Ezekiel was obviously Old Testament, something that the Jews and the Muslims believe in this particular chapter and verse. Now they don't believe the whole Old Testament, the Muslims don't, but they do believe in parts of it. And this is something that they take and give credit to as a prophet. Now, where, anywhere in your religion, since this is something that we all believe, Christian, Muslim, and Jew, where in your 
faith, in your theology, as Jews and as Muslims, where is the prince mentioned or identified in another subject? There are none. There are none. We cannot say that Muhammad was a prince of peace. Can't say that. We cannot say that David or Moses was a prince of peace. They weren't. For example, Muhammad got a 10,000 man army in Medina, went back to Mecca and just about destroyed it. And ever since then, it has been a, a religion, if you will, of Islam, which means submit to in Arabic. Okay? It means submit to and do what you have to do. In fact, Muhammad even said out of his own mouth, there are two spheres in the world. That is Islam and that that will become Islam and basically talking about force. But Muhammad cannot be that Messiah. He cannot be based on the fact that he was a man of war. David was a man of war. Moses was a man of war. They went through and they, they destroyed and they done what needed to be done. Uh, David and Moses and, and even uh, uh, Solomon have all been man of wars. They've done what they had to do to bring the Jews back to the promised land that God had promised them. So they cannot be the Prince of Peace. But there is one mentioned in the Bible as the Prince of Peace. And there is only one in history of all religions who is known for the Prince of Peace, or the Prince as Ezekiel talks about. Now, who is that one? And of course we already know, and we can already identify that as Jesus Christ. But to give you specific evidence of what Jesus' purpose was to come to this earth, I want you, if you will, to go to John chapter 16, I'm going to read verse 33. John 16 and verse 33. Only one verse, and it reads as this. And of course, this is Jesus speaking, so listen tentatively, if you would. It says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace in the world. Ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And basically what Jesus is doing here, He's giving a specific identity of Himself. First of all, for those who follow Jesus Christ, they find peace. Peace based on His compassion and His love and His forgiveness. They find peace away from sin. In other words, all the things that has caused your life to be chaotic and crazy have now settled down and things are quiet based on what Jesus Christ can bring to those who believe in Him. But, Jesus also said that He has defeated the world. In other words, the world has nothing that it can throw at Him in wars and battles and blaspheming and mocking. There's nothing they can throw at Him and win against Him. He has defeated the world. How did Jesus defeat the world? Simply by being buried in a tomb with our sin dead upon Him, but then again rising from that tomb. You can go to the tomb of Jesus Christ. You can do all the study that you want to do. And you will find that no one has ever been in that tomb that decayed and rotted and stayed dead. In other words, the body of Jesus was taken into that tomb, but it does not show decay. It shows that someone was temporarily, that was dead, a body that was temporary, was in that grave. And somehow, it's gone now. And no one except the Bible can explain how that body came out of that grave. And there's lies that are kind of moving around societies, okay, and cultures, and religions. But no one has evidence of anything outside of what the Bible says that He rose again. He rose again defeating the world. How can you defeat an enemy that cannot be killed? Jesus Christ cannot be killed. They tried to crucify Him, but He rose again. But that was His plan. Jesus came to die on a cross, came to rise again to defeat the sins of the world, showing the power of God in Jesus Christ. The power that has stability, if you will, to overrule everything that the world can throw at Him. He can overrule it. And folks, to me, that's power beyond anything that we know of on this earth. How do you defeat an enemy that cannot be killed? Cannot be killed. Now, Jesus delivered 
this claim in John 16, verse 33. He delivered this claim which had a monumental outcome. In other words, he said, I have defeated the world. And he indeed did defeat the world. And he indeed did many times while he was in his ministry for three years. He proved that he was the Prince of Peace by taking away the things that take away the peace that we have in this world. Now, if He can take away the things that take away our peace in this world, He can certainly give us peace eternally. Because the world is our only enemies, those who are born again, if you will. The world is our only enemies. The born again has only one enemy, and that is the world itself. In other words, they will do everything they can to discredit the born again Christian to mock the born-again Christian. But somehow, the born-again Christian still has peace with them. There's all these things going on outwardly, yet inwardly, we have this eternal peace that cannot be removed. You know, I've seen as many where Islam has went out and cut heads off Christians. And if you look at those Christians, you'll see they're not screaming and hollering and begging. They're dying in peace. It says, though God has given them dying grace, as the Bible says He would do. And then we see in Revelation that retaliation against those that cut off the heads of the Christians will come. God will have a day where He will punish those who done that to the Christians. But the Christians that are dying, die in peace. How come you can't threaten a Christian with death and win? Because a Christian don't mind dying. It doesn't fear them. And that is the ultimate peace that Jesus challenged that He could give us and did indeed deliver to us. It is the ultimate. Now, showing that He can deliver peace in a time, if you will, that's needed most. And folks, wouldn't you say that in our society, in our culture today, that uh, this kind of peace is needed. In other words, the Christians are the ones who really are the ones being blasphemed and mocked and destroyed more than any other religion on earth. Now, yes, if you're Jewish, Islam hates you. If you're, you know, it's possible to get to you, they will. But they want the ultimate goal. They want to take over the land of Israel. And individual Jews and things like this, they're not going after in massive amounts. Yes, they are doing what they can, where they can, but it's not necessarily your great defense measures that are stopping them. The Muslims can get through if they wanted to, but they seem to be targeting the born-again Christians more than they are Jews as far as individual killings. And it seems like that is their purpose as though something inside of them hates the born-again Christian. Now, the world's in turmoil. We see criminal acts being performed in every nation. Just street gangs, Islam uh, terrorists. We see criminals. We see children disobeying their parents. We see all these things. And the world is seeking peace, and Jesus said He could deliver peace, but are we in a time where He can... Or this would be best fit for him to deliver that peace. Absolutely. Peace is what the world is looking for. The Prince of Peace is what the world needs. The only one who can bring real peace as he has brought the Christians before. As I stated a while ago, Christians have already got peace. No matter what happens in this world, we have peace because we know our eternity is spent with God forever and ever and ever. And there's nothing in this world that can challenge us to remove that faith or remove that peace from us. No threats, nothing. And Jesus told a woman at the well one time, said, drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. And ladies and gentlemen, if you're thirsty for peace, Christ is the only one that can bring that. He is. He can forgive you for your sins. He can remove the guilt from you. And He can give you peace throughout eternity. Now, we're looking in a world today of many leaders that are saying the right things according to what people want to hear. But do these leaders have the power to deliver the peace that they are talking about? Not as long as, not as long as their enemies can defeat them. And 
the United States is a powerful, great, big country. But if you take enough people in the world, such, let's say, Russia, China, and other nations gather up and want to declare war on the United States as powerful as we are, they could defeat us because they could kill us and annihilate us. But what if nobody on this earth could kill Americans? And I'm being silly. I don't believe this. But let's say, what if no one could? Then how could they ever beat us? No matter what, we would always win. Because we could kill a hundred of them versus them killing one of us and us coming back alive to kill ten more of them. In other words, it's an ongoing thing. We cannot die. Now, if Christ cannot die, He is the one who can defeat the enemy. If He can defeat the enemy, then He is the winner. Correct? Now, we're looking in the world today, as I was stating a while ago, for one of these leaders to bring this peace into the world. And eventually it will come to a place where they will say that the Antichrist, a world leader who will lead all nations, will give us this peace. But we're looking desperately today because there's such turmoil in the world today. And we're looking at different leaders. And eventually these leaders are going to give allegiance to this one leader, which will be the Antichrist, is what the Bible tells us. But as of today, we do know, do we not? <clears> that President Trump, he cannot bring world peace. He can't do it because he can't be defeated if enough go against him. We know that Benjamin Netanyahu, he cannot bring world peace because if enough nations go against him, they can defeat him. We know that King Abdul, he cannot bring world peace because if enough nations goes against Jordan, they can defeat it. We also know that I don't know, Rodrigo, uh, Dutria, okay, he cannot bring world peace based on the fact that if enough nations go against him, they can defeat him. So folks, we must not look in the wrong places for peace. It must be Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Peace can only come through the power, as I said a moment ago, of one who cannot be defeated. Now, Jesus could not be defeated. He rose from the grave. But, while He was on earth, did He prove that He was the Prince of Peace? Did He remove the problems that individuals had in the world? Did He come about with an image that stated, this is a different leader. This is a different person. This man must be of God based on what he can perform. And I want to scan just through a few that Jesus perhaps touched or did touch while he was on this earth. And I want to start with a religious leader, Nicodemus. He was part of the Sanhedrin of the Jewish religion. And as he was investigating and pondering and wondering what the right religion really was, even though he was a Jew, he did not have secure evidence in his heart that he was on the right path. He was seeking something. And he was watching Jesus while Jesus was on this earth. And one night he came by secret because he did not want others to know what he had done in the Judaism or the Sanhedrin, if you will. He did not want them to know that he had come to Jesus because Jesus was their enemy. And he was one that was challenging what they taught and what they believed. So he came to Jesus by night and he asked Jesus, how do you do what you do? I see that you perform these great miracles and nobody can perform these miracles that you do except he be of God. And then he asked Jesus a strange question for a religious leader to ask. What must I do to enter to the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus said, you must be born again. In other words, what is born of the flesh is of the flesh. What is born of the Spirit is of the Spirit. Jesus was telling him, look, if you believe in me, then yes, you will be born of the Spirit of God who will live within you and give you peace. 
And suddenly Nicodemus, as he accepted the invitation of Jesus, found something that he had never experienced in any religion. That he, or the religion, let's put it that way. The religion that he was a part of. And that was this eternal peace. Nicodemus began to follow Jesus around. He even spoke up during Jesus' trials. He even was there when the body of Jesus was taken down and helped with it. Nicodemus became a born-again Christian and found this peace on earth. So did Jesus deliver peace? Yes, He did. And there was a second one. A woman that had a blood issue came to Jesus. In other words, her body was sick. And things were going on that was destroying her. She had tried many physicians, many doctors, and tried to find a cure for what she had had, this disease. And she could not find it. Everyone used her to take her money because she was a wealthy woman. And they took everything that she had and left her with nothing but a little room to live in. And one day she heard out of her window a great crowd of people hollering, Yahshua, Yahshua, or the Messiah, or Jesus. And suddenly she realized, maybe, this is my hope. Maybe this will help me. Because she had heard how Jesus had healed people. She had heard about the love and the compassion of Jesus and how He gave of Himself freely to others. And that people went away satisfied and at peace. And she felt, if I could be cured of this disease, this infirmity that I have, then yes, I can have peace. And so she crawled down her steps out into the street. And I can imagine because of the great crowd that was around Jesus, her struggling, trying to get through that crowd, crawling on her hands and knees. People stepping on her hands perhaps. People stepping and pushing her with their knees out of the way. Trying to get to Jesus themselves. Not caring that she was desperate with an infirmity, a disease that needed to be cured. She finally made her way to Jesus and touched the hem of His garment, which is the prayer cloth that He had wrapped Himself in. She had touched it, and Jesus stopped as the whole crowd was trying to mob Him and come to Him and get some kind of favor. Jesus stopped in the middle of all of this and said, Whoa, somebody just touched me. I felt the virtue come out of me. Now, a couple of disciples laughed at Jesus and said, Jesus, there's thousands of people here. How can you say somebody touched you? Hundreds have touched you. He said, No, but this one was special. And it was this woman that had this blood issue. She was healed instantly the moment that she touched Jesus. She found peace. So did Jesus deliver peace to Nicodemus? Yes, He did. Did Jesus deliver peace to this woman with the blood issue? Yes, He did. The woman that was caught in the very act of adultery. Jesus gave her peace. She was about to be stoned to death. Jesus pretty much put her on the level of men. He said, He without sin cast the first stone. These men also had committed acts of sin that was worthy of death. In secret they had done theirs, but Jesus knew what they had done. He placed her on their level and said, Any of you that don't have sin that is worthy of death, you throw a stone at her first. He lifted her up. And then He asked her, as they threw down their rocks and they left, Jesus asked her, Where are those thine accusers? She said, Lord, I have none. He said, I accuse you not either. Go and sin no more. And when He said, I accuse you not either, go, repent of the sin, don't do it again. You know what she obtained? Peace. Peace in her life. Did Jesus deliver? Peace. Yes. So we see physical attribute. Woman with a blood issue found peace. A woman who was a criminal, who was wayward, who was sinful, received peace. A person of religion, Nicodemus, received peace because he found finally the answer to what he was seeking for. That eternal peace. Jesus told the woman at the well, drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. In other words, try me. You won't seek anything else. Christians don't want anything else. We have the answer. We have what we're supposed to have. We know that we have a relationship with God and we are satisfied with that relationship. The Apostle Paul, he found peace on the road to Damascus. He was going out trying to defend his religion. Trying to defend his religion. And Jesus stopped him and said, Paul, Paul, why are you doing this? And he said, who are you? He said, I am Jesus. Why are you persecuting me? Paul, you're, you're kicking against the pricks. In other words, you're getting nowhere. You're going out trying to defend a religion. Defend it. And I am the way. 
I am the truth. I am the lie. And this religion that you're trying to defend is going to get you nowhere. Follow me, Paul. And Paul did. And Paul set the world on fire for Jesus Christ. He went west and he traveled all through Europe. And he done all these great things bringing Jesus to other people. Giving them the same peace that Paul had obtained. Jesus in history has proved he alone has power to remove what steals the peace of each one of us as individuals, personally. He has the power to remove what steals our peace and will one day walk through that eastern gate that's behind me. That gate will crumble and the Prince of Peace will sit on the throne as King of Kings and Lord of Lords over the entire world. He will defeat all nations, all religions, all concepts of, of ideologies of government. He will defeat it all. And he will sit as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Prince of Peace will sit on the throne of the world. The true Prince of Peace. Folks, that is what we're seeking. That is what we're after. Jesus to be ruler of this world. If you're born again, if you're a Christian, that to you is a great day coming. But there are those who will be defeated based on the fact that he will first have to defeat the nations. Sometime this week, go to Revelation 19, read verses 14 to 16, or even more verses in chapter 19. Read the whole chapter, chapter 19, of what Jesus Christ will accomplish when he comes to this earth. He will defeat the nations, or all those who are opposition to him. In other words, he can defeat what takes away the peace of the world. The Islam faith, the Catholic faith, Jehovah Witness faith, all these other faiths are removing peace. Religion brings wars. And we know this. They are the key to most wars that are fought on this earth. But Christ is not religion. Christ is the way. He is the truth. And He is the life. I do not subscribe to religion. I subscribe to being born again, a child of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I am a born again Christian. In other words, I have found the way. The way. Religions try to bring you to a way, but I am going the way. And folks, today, you too can subscribe to going the way and not a way. There is a difference. The and A. The way, A way. You must decide which path you want to travel. A way is broad. That's what the Bible tells us. The way is narrow. There are only few. Because religion has prestige. Some power on earth. But God, as the Bible tells us in Revelation, He will defeat all these things thus bringing what removes peace from the world. He will remove those things so that peace will be upon the world. Folks, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Catholicism, Jehovah Witness, on and on and on, are mainly the problem, not the answer. When Christ alone sets King of Kings and Lord of Lords, only then will peace be upon this earth. All these others will bow their knee, the Bible tells us, and confess that He is Lord. They will do this. This will be accomplished by the power that He has to remove what is removing the peace. No other qualifies for what Ezekiel told us would come. A prince that will go through this eastern gate. No other qualifies. Judaism and Islam. You have no one that qualifies as prince of peace. Jesus alone is the way, the truth, and the life. And how do you obtain a relationship with Christ? You confess that you have been part of the problem that you have a sinful nature based on what has been passed down you through your bloodlines.
these things have brought you to where you are and you have a sinful nature. And that you want to become born again. You want the Spirit of God to live within you. And you want that Spirit to guide you and direct you and give you truth and understanding and peace and satisfaction forevermore. You receive this by confessing your sins and repenting or be willing to not commit these sins any longer. Now there are times that you will stumble. But the salvation of Jesus Christ is permanent. Once you have asked for forgiveness, He will forgive you. He will dwell within you. But He will guide you through His Spirit. You will be born of that Spirit, not of the flesh that you had before. You receive that gift of Jesus Christ. You believe that He died on the cross to remove your sins. In other words, your sins was placed upon Him in death. But He was raised to walk in a newness of life. And that is what you're adopting through Him. You've got to believe this. And accept this gift of God. And believe that God is three parts. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Simply because the Spirit brings you to the understanding you need forgiveness. Jesus, who is the Son of God, died as a man on a cross to forgive you for your sins to represent you. God the Father accepts you because of what God the Son has done for you. Folks, it's not hard. It's a lot easier than some of these concepts I've heard in these crazy, crazy idealisms of these other religions. It's the way, the truth, and the life. Do this, and I promise you, I promise you, you will never, ever seek anything else. You will have perfect perfect peace inside of your soul and your spirit through Christ. Do it today.